Well, hello team, we are at it again, moving on. We, assuming you've studied your electron configurations, right? Preferably, especially if you're gonna do anything where you wanna apply an electron configuration to figure out something, I highly, highly recommend you use the orbital box diagram and you can usually use the noble gas core, you know, shortcut. But it's nice to see the individual orbitals and, you know, whether electrons are spin up, spin down, whether they're paired or unpaired. It's really going to help us a lot. So I highly recommend you do that for everything we're going to be talking about because we're going to be really looking now at application of electron configurations. And can we use those to infer trends we see on the periodic table as far as atomic properties, right? Not all of them, just some of them. We don't have an infinite amount of time. But we know we got our periodic table, right? And Dmitry Mendeleev originally did it by increasing atomic mass. Found out that wasn't quite right, but he didn't know about subatomic particles. So that was quite unfair, but it's truly phenomenal what he did. Um, so I think it was Henry Mosley uh, later, I'm not going to go into the details of that. Unfortunately, I think he got killed in World War One. What a bummer! He was the one who finally figured out we should order this in terms of increasing atomic number, right? Z, number of protons in the nucleus, one, two, three, four, which causes a few of the masses, which messed up Dmitri Mendeleev. You know, when he was putting in, 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 you know, groups here with similar chemical properties and stuff, he noticed some of the masses didn't increase; they went down as you, you know, went along. He's like, well, that's just weird. Well, there are a few. It's kind of what you can find them on here there, where if you go by increasing atomic number now, that a few of the mass, you'd think the mass would keep going up as you increase number of protons and nucleus. But there's a few where there's a switcheroo, kind of funky business there, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into it. But we know we're increasing by atomic number. And what we're interested in is what are some properties, you know? I'm not going to go through, you know, like... We'll, we'll learn actually next semester probably, you know, trends and boiling points. You know, they tend to increase in melting points and boiling points and densities. You can kind of figure out a lot of that stuff just by looking at it. We're going to look at some other ones that are a little more um, as a lead-in to reactivity. We're interested in looking at that periodic table using electron configurations so trying to predict chemical behavior, right? How would this element react with that element? What would we get? What would the compound be? Would it be covalent? Would, be, would it be ionic? So we need this chapter to look at at, hey, if we have an electron configuration, can we predict to a, a high degree of confidence some of these atomic properties and look at how they change as they go down the periodic table or as they go across the periodic table? That's our goal for this chapter. So we'll go through, you know, maybe four, five, six, I don't know, I'll list them up on the next board, and then we'll count them, uh, different types of atomic properties. We'll look at one each turn and apply electron configurations, electron shielding, orbital penetration. You thought you were done with that? Ha <laughs> ha, no, never. All right, here's the ones we're gonna focus on, given enough time, and hopefully I'll do it in that same order I have it up there. So using electron configurations, I think it'd be pretty straightforward to look at the preferred ionic charge or charges. We'll find out some of them do multiple ones of the elements on the periodic table. Now, we've already talked about that. We already talked about how they want to be isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. So, but let's look at it from an electron configuration perspective and, and, you know, go down the rabbit hole a little bit more, right? And then we'll also look at magnetic behavior, kind of introduced you to that already, based on unpaired electrons versus not having unpaired electrons. Oh! Then we'll jump into uh, atomic size. I'm not sure if I'm going to do atomic size in one video, then ion size in the other, but I'll probably merge them together. Looking at trends, you know, how big does an atom get if you go down a periodic table, right? So do they get bigger going down or smaller? And if we go across a period, do they get bigger or smaller and why? And then we'll look at ions, right? So if we lose electrons to form a cation, does that make that bigger or smaller than the parent atom? And if we gain an electron or more to form an anion, does that make that bigger or smaller than the parent atom? And trends of ions versus ions, how do you know? Is this cation bigger than that anion? Ah, we're going to look at all that stuff because we're going to find out these are important for reactivity later. The, the size of it has an impact on that, right? We're going to look at ionization energy, hugely important when we're looking at ionic compound formation, right? Uh, you're ionizing something, removing an electron to form a cation. What are the energetics involved? We'll do some calculations, give you some values, and we'll look at the trends on the periodic table. And from an electron configuration perspective, uh, we can relate it to that, or can we relate it to size? Can we predict the trends going down a column or across a period on the periodic table and explain it? 
We'll do the same thing with electron affinity, right? Kind of the opposite. Ionization energy is removing an electron. Of electron affinity is adding an electron or more. What are the trends? Can we do some mathematics with it? Can we explain those trends using atomic size, electron affinity, I mean, uh, electron configurations, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Then we're going to look a little bit, not too big a detail, on reducing and oxi oxidizing strength. You thought you were done with redox. No, let's see if we can actually predict, right? If we go down a column with the ability for that species to give an electron and reduce something, increase or decrease, right? Or if we're going left to right across a period, across a row, uh, with, with the ability to, say, take an electron and oxidize something, increase or decrease, looking at oxidizing uh, strength and reducing strength for reducing agents and oxidizing agents. Can we predict it? And what types of reactions would we get? And last but not least, acid-base behavior. We've looked at acid-base reactions, but let's look at it from an atomic perspective, right? Looking at electron configurations, sizes, ionization energy, electron affinity. Can we predict whether this element would be more acidic or less acidic than that one? Right? What are the trends for those types of things? You know, would it act as an acid or would it act as a base or neither? And then we'll do that for elements as well as oxides. We'll look at metal oxides and non-metal oxides because they're found fairly commonly on the planet, right? Very few things are found in the pure form, like the noble gases, you know, gold, a few things like that, the noble metals and uh, uh, noble gases. Most other things are highly reactive with either sulfur or oxygen or something. So you, in the real world, you find most things like metals as metal oxides. Right? Would that make it a little more basic, a little more acidic? What are some trends? What are the kinds of reactions and whatnot? Um, so again, I just wanted to do a quick video on this one. Uh, just as an introduction to what we're going to be doing. So we'll, in the next video, we'll focus on preferred ionic charge formation. And I go into great detail on that. We're going to look at, you know, four, I think it's four specific uh, sections of the periodic table. S block, P block, D block. Not going to do the F block, all right? <laughs> and we'll look at metals versus non-metals. So we'll do S block metals, P block metals, um, non-metals, which are P block, and then we'll jump into the transition metals. Some of those rules kind of apply for the uh, F block as well, but um, those are challenging electron configurations. So this is your little intro uh, for this particular topic. Let's get into the details in the next video. Yahoo!